This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. From the first phone call 140 years ago to mobile video streaming today, AT&T innovates to improve lives. And by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing the critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 65 years. Welcome to NJBIA's Money Your Business. I'm your host, Bob Considine. Well, the New Jersey Reentry Corporation is a nonprofit with a social mission to remove all barriers to employment for citizens returning from jail or prison. Here to discuss the latest ongoings at the NJRC is its chairman, former Governor Jim McGreevy. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Bob, it's good to be with you. So let's get right into it. For people and employers in particular, who aren't familiar with the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, what is it? Give your elevator pitch. Sure, our elevator pitch is that for the 9,000 persons who are our clients returning from state prison, county jail, addiction treatment, our goal is to provide them with the services required so that they can reenter into the workforce. Right. And as my father used to say, a job is the best social welfare program in the world. But before people can have a job, Bob, they need to have a motor vehicle identification. They need to be ensured that they have access to health care, whether that's Medicaid, whether that's access to a physician or prescription drugs. They need to be safe and structured sober housing. And they need to have the benefit of employment and training. And so our goal is to make sure that people are prepared, if you will, that they're employment ready. And that's why I particularly want to thank Michelle Sekirka and NJBIA. It's Michelle's tremendous leadership. I'll tell you how bad Michelle is. She actually had Jim McGreevy be the NJBIA representative on a Governor Christie task force. I said, my God, how far we've all come. She's very non-political. She's tremendous, but I, she's so indulgent. But the important part is working with employers to make sure that our guys and gals are workforce ready. And that's our charge. Right. So when they come to you, what is the level of need do you find? Does it range? Uh, and how do you get them to that point where they're ready to go out into the workforce? Sure. I, and I, that's a great question. I mean, the first that there are a lot of misnomers as to certain types of crimes. A lot of employers will see murder or first degree felony and they'll naturally and understandably shy away. But ironically, it's the guy or gal who's been in prison for a long period of time, uh, who has matured, who has changed their life. So what we try to do is we have a social worker, we have a lawyer, uh, we have an addiction treatment person, we have an employment specialist at every one of our eight sites. And what we do is we do a biopsychosocial, we look at their criminal history, their medical history, we look to make sure they have those basic services, uh, whether it's family reunification or it's healthcare, and then we get them employment ready. And part of getting employment ready is working with, uh, with Rob, the Commissioner of Labor and Workforce Development, working with Michelle, uh, working with whether it's the auto industry, uh, whether it's Shop, ShopRite, Wakefern, a lot of the food industry, um, UPS, uh, Federal Express, so those industries that what we say in the business are reentry friendly. I'll just leave you with the thought though, a lot of these guys and gals really want to work hard. Um, they know they've made bad decisions in life. Uh, for the young guys, frankly, a lot of it's drugs and, and the chaos of the streets. For the older guys, sometimes it's more serious crimes. I actually prefer working with the older guys um, there's, there's a sense of maturity and a sense of wisdom. Uh, they're looking for second chances. But, you know, as a friend of mine says, he only hires uh, ex-felons, uh, no millennials, just court-involved persons. Because these guys and gals, we just had a, a great program with UPS last week where they hired 63 of our participants from our Essex County facility. 
So what you'll find is people that really want to do something differently, Bob, but it's making sure that they're workforce ready, making sure that they have the necessary language arts schools, skills, mathematical skills, uh, that they're drug tested, and to send to the respective employer somebody who's ready to take the job seriously. And how important that, uh, Governor, is it that people actually find gainful employment so they don't return to from which they came? Bob, Bob it's everything. And I, I just, if I could give a shout out to One Huddle. Uh, One Huddle is a great app and we've got a partnership, a strategic partnership with them. In fact, they've done a re-entry app for the people, 3,000 people that are coming out of prison. Uh, so a job ultimately is going to determine somebody's success or failure. And that's why, you know, for me, you know, working, you know, I've gone to every midsize, you know, old Italian or Jewish owned business in New Jersey. And God bless uh, many of these families who have hired our guys. Um, it becomes a little more candidly challenging dealing with a, a national chain. Uh, if I could give out a shout out to Walmart, who hires our guys. But, you you know, I walk into a shop, right? I walk into uh, some of the New Jersey-based companies. But when I think of UPS, I think of Walmart. Those are companies that are willing to give people second chances. Sometimes it's a little difficult because a local Jersey outpost is driven by HR regs at a home office in Iowa or Arkansas. Right. So... Uh, sometimes we have to navigate that. But a job is ultimately, and, and we continue to work with our clients, Bob, for literally up to three years when they've left prison. And, and Governor, just briefly, I know in September, the NJRC launched a special effort to help women uh, who were once incorporated as the Women's Reentry Commission. What is the goal of the commission? Yeah, the role of the commission is to work. And in fact, we had a great task force today with all these doctors and to look at OBGYN and to look at the fact that so many women in prison don't have satisfactory or don't have the necessary OBGYN or, or issues around pregnancy or childbirth or issues of, around you know, menopause and, and depression. And so the, the whole goal of the, of, the, of the commission, and I want to give a shout out to Senate President Steve Sweeney and to Craig Coughlin, the speaker, is to look at these issues and to work with great Gloria Bachman from RWJ, Dr. Chris Purnell from um, uh, University Health, Sue Wang from RWJ, uh, Akash Shah from Hackensack, um, Loretta Weinberg was on the call, um, Yvonne Lopez. So it's all of these leaders, thinkers coming together and saying, all right, how are we going to do healthcare better? How are we going to deliver health care? To go back to your first question, Bob, if somebody's going to be workforce ready, what is it that we have to do? And how do we deliver health care, whether it's hepatitis, diabetes, HIV, depression, anxiety? How do we make sure people are ready for the workforce? Great. And Governor, one last question. You know, you're a former governor. Um, you could go into any vocation. Why is this one personally so important to you? Well, it's, it's all about, and, and again, it's, it's all about for me for second chances. And I know in my life, you know, you know, I've made bad decisions and life sometimes has been messy. I remember when I was in seminary, I was up at Exodus uh, Transitional Community up in Harlem. And I would see all these guys that frankly could have broken me like a twig. These guys were built. And I would ask them, well, here, call this number for your GED. And Bob, after years of being in prison, being told when to get up, when to eat, literally when to go to the bathroom, they were almost incapable of self-actualizing thought or action. Hmm. And I thought there has to be a better way. And I'm just grateful to, you know, all the governors on our board um, and, and Governor Christie and Governor Murphy, Governor Corzine, Governor Florio, um, for, and Governor Kane for, and, and a bipartisan, I, you know, Governor Whitman. It's, it's just all about us understanding that we shouldn't be defined by the nadir of our existence, that when people make bad decisions for so many, um, particularly for our participants, 
they grew up in trauma and I could talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and the circumstances of their families and, and bluntly how difficult prison is and how ill-prepared people are to come out. But it's for those significant majority, just to harken back to the UPS um, job drive the other day, I thought to myself, I, I wish America could see this. These were these guys and gals, everybody was dressed, their hair was cut, they had their best clothes, they were filling out the application, they were saying why they wanted to work for UPS. And it was like, it was meaningful to me, Bob. I mean, here are these guys just, you know, they had their license, they had their CBL, they just wanted to work, they wanted to do it right, play by the rules. And so it's about second chances. And for me, whether it's spiritually or theologically, it's understanding that, you know, we got to live into our better angels and give people an opportunity to do that. So I, again, I just want to thank you. I really want to thank Michelle. Michelle's an incredible partner. I mean, I, I don't understand how she does it. I get Neither. emails from Michelle at 11 o'clock at night, 4.30 in the morning about, here, Jim, look at this, this, and this. Have you thought about this regulation? Um, and she connects me with people all, all over the state. So it's, it's, I just want to thank NJBIA. I want to thank your voice, uh, your articulation, because it's bringing more people into this. So people have a chance to be law abiding, to be productive, to be taxpayers, then to be in state prisons at a cost of $55,000 a year, draining the state as opposed to contributing to themselves, their families, and God willing, their community. Right. Well, it, that's certainly one thing people need to pay attention to. And uh, Jim McGreevy, this is great work. We really appreciate wow. what you're doing. And thank you so much for being here. Come back anytime. Thanks so much, Bob. Take care. And we'll be right back. These days, it's anything but business as usual. That's why working together is more important than ever. AT&T is committed to keeping you connected so you can keep your patients cared for, your customers served, your students inspired, and your employees closer than ever. Our network is resilient. Our people are strong. Our job is to keep your business connected. It's what we've always done. It's what we'll always do. You were first. First to respond. First to put others' lives before your own. And in an emergency, you need a network that puts you first, that connects you to technology and each other, that's built with and for first responders. FirstNet, the only officially authorized wireless network for first responders. Because putting you first is our job. Welcome back to Minding Your Business. I'm Bob Considine. Well, Tim McLuhan is one of New Jersey's most famous restaurateurs. He's a philanthropist, and he's a New Jersey Hall of Famer. So how did COVID-19 impact his restaurant empire? Well, we went to the Supper Club in Asbury Park to find out. Let's take a look. So Tim, as we sit here in the Supper Club, I'm reminded of an event that happened here about, well, eight years ago this week. Um, Superstorm, Sandy, Superstorm Sandy Rolster. Yeah. And yeah, I remember that too. Yeah, I know. And the story goes in, in this very room, the Supper Club, is you had sand in the bottom, in the basement, and took months to come back from it. And sometime when you reopen the following year, you sit at the piano and you say, all right, where were we? <laughs> I'm so clever. Yeah, so clever. <laughs> but I, I'm wondering, as we think back to that, is this year, with everything you and the restaurant injuries, industry has gone through, is it in any way comparable, better or worse, than mm. what happened to Superstorm That's Sandy? a great question, but I have to tell you one thing before. Sure. The night before, mm -hmm. Sandy, <laughs> the reason I was in this room is we were playing with Benny King. Oh, wow. And the last song we did was Stand, Stand By, by me. me. Sure. Little did we know, and we knew a storm was coming, but right. we didn't know, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think, um, well, there's a couple of major differences. One, that one affected our infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we had, we did have tons of sand in the basement and we lost all kinds of refrigeration, not just here in our other locations too. So mm -hmm. company wide for us, it, it was really destructive. Obviously the Rum Runner, our original restaurant in Seabright, right. half of it ended up in the river, uh, got pushed in uh, from the ocean side. So we were out of business there for three and a half years. Right. Here, oh, right. it was more of a question of cleanup. Yeah. We were very fortunate here. 
But now to say as compared to the to COVID, the dilemma with COVID is just perception. Uh, do people feel safe? I, I think that uh, I'm really gratified. We have a way that people can contact me directly. Uh, they don't know that necessarily. <laughs> when they make a comment, they uh, will now. It's, it's on their check in. <laughs> Tune in, folks. Um, no, but I really appreciate it. Every morning, I read stuff from the night before. Mm -hmm. uh, just people making comments, you know, love the food, uh, my hamburger was overcooked, right. or, you know, whatever. But I really relish the people that say, I felt safe. We were, we were nervous about coming back, but it was a very safe environment. Thank you for that, you know. Mm -hmm. And everybody doesn't say something good. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had some people saying, you know, our server, the mask was below their nose mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, it's such a different thing. I've been sort of thinking in my own mind that there's at least a third of restaurant going people who are not going to do it. They're just going to be, let's right. wait till this whole thing clears out. So two thirds will do it, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the good news, bad news is that so many places have gone out of business, which yeah. is horrible news right. in any industry. You don't want your industry failing, uh, that it's created more competition for the seats available. Mm -hmm. So we actually had a reasonable summer in most of our places because we had outside dining. Right. But we had to close four places because we didn't have outside dining. Right. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's just, it's a totally <laughs> different kind of experience that what it's about now yeah. is safety and protocols. And of course we have, the storm came and it left, you know, and we had a huge high uh, pressure system that came in following it right. where the weather was gorgeous. Right. Um, this, we have no idea if it's ever leaving. Yeah. I mean, we assume it is, but yeah. you know, it's that's, that's the toughest part. And I think even emotionally, yeah. um, and you know, you're trying to figure out your relationship with your municipality, with your landlord, with the bank, you know, how's everybody feeling about this? Mm -hmm. You know, we've had offers to do other places that are kind of attractive to us, which is crazy, I guess, on the face of it. Sure. You'd say, oh, let's get another yeah, one. Right. As long as we're in trouble, we might as well get 12 more is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, does the bank feel, you know, I don't think this is such a good idea for you. So right. it, it's a totally different problem. I think in terms of, in pure economic terms, this is much, much worse. Okay. Yeah. I want to just go a little chronologically. You, talk, you go back to the spring. You know, you're a job creator. You're basically a one-man uh, employment generator. <laughs> and you have to lay off... A, 700. 700. When, as I said, when we had 12 restaurants on March 15th. Right. On March 16th, they all burned to the ground. <laughs> and on March 17th, we had to let 700 people go. How difficult was that for you? You know, I, to be truthful about it, um, I think that I went into kind of a, a semi-coma. <laughs> I really do. I think I kind of shut down. I, I, would, I don't like using the term PTSD. Right. Because there are people who sure. go to war and, and you yeah. know, it's a different thing. Real deal. But it was kind of a form of it. Something bad happened. The same thing happened actually after Sandy. Right. For, for a couple of weeks after this, I, I just, I didn't engage, you know, realizing that there was no choice about letting people go. So it wasn't I was agonizing about it. It was clear. And fortunately, unemployment help came relatively quickly mm -hmm. in New Jersey. Yeah. The PPP money felt like it took forever. Yeah. You and I wouldn't be sitting here right, right now if there had not been that. And I'm certainly hoping they figure something out for another go round, yeah. you know, even if it's significantly less. Right. But um, the letting go of people, the individual stories didn't start creeping back in to me for, you know, a week or so when I started realizing you start thinking of the names and the people. And of course, we're friends with them. Yeah a lot of the people that work in our places, mm -hmm. it's crossed over. I mean, I've been in business doing this since 1987. Right. So if I could do math, no. Th so for 33 <laughs> years, right. you, you eventually get to a point where they become your friends, yeah, you know? Sure. And you go through, you know, marriages and divorces and births and deaths yes, and yep. the whole thing. So it started creeping back in. I felt much worse probably two weeks later, three weeks later when I realized, ah, this isn't, just, this isn't Superstorm Sandy, it's right. not going away. Eventually, eventually, yeah. uh, outdoor dining is pr permitted, and that probably worked out okay for you because most of your restaurants have an outdoor. Yeah, uh, you know, of the twelve places, we closed two permanently. Okay, they're they're, they're gone. Okay, and then we had four others that really couldn't do outside. Right. Our little place, CJ's in Titten Falls, we could have put two tables if we cheated we might have been able to get a third table out right. there yeah. you can't exactly hire a chef to do what we like to do right. on that level right. you know so it was kind of like dominoes falling in a good way 
okay, the bad way, the storm comes, I mean, the, uh, the storm, the Same pandemic other, comes, yeah. we shut down, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then mm -hmm. to go food, we're not set up for that, we don't do it terribly, well. we do it better now, but at the beginning it was like 1%, 2% of what we would normally do, mm -hmm. PPP funds come, okay, that's going to take us out a couple of months while we're looking then outside dining, yeah. all right, miraculous weather. Yeah, we had miraculous. Well, July was like twenty nine or thirty one days, but it was yeah. sunny. The days. sun came out twenty nine yeah. of the thirty one, yeah. and the two that it didn't, we didn't get washed out. Mm -hmm. And I said that hurricane that I still can't pronounce, Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. <laughs> good for you. Um, we were open that night at four o'clock in mm -hmm. five of our six operating places. Right. So there was that, but now, you know, we've had rain a couple of days. It's getting cold at night. You yeah. can feel it closing in, and it's yeah. coming. Yeah. And th what's running the show now is six feet. The, the six foot distance, well, most people probably don't realize it, right. and why would they? It's not from table to table, it's from the back of this chair right. to the back of the next chair. Yeah. So I have to have six feet between the two chairs when they're pulled out. Right. So the tables are, I don't know, 11 feet apart, 12 feet apart. Nice. And if they said tomorrow, let's go to 100%, mm -hmm. we could probably, with six feet ruling the day, we could probably get to, I don't know, 35, 40% of capacity. Right. We would not get to 100% capacity. That's interesting, yeah. So that's one of the things people don't talk about. Hey, if we get to 100%, great. But, yeah, but it doesn't still, really yeah. change things. So you mentioned 25% capacity. We've been there for a while. It looked like there might have been an, an inclination that expanded a little bit. But we've had, at, as we tape this, certainly a whole lot more positive tests for coronavirus. But the good part is the transmission has stayed relatively relatively flat, yeah right you know and number of deaths you know yeah. which is i can't believe we, you know we talk about deaths so casually yeah. now in this country it's like oh you know, only 12 people died today mm -hmm. so that's 12 atomic bombs going off in a family right right, right? and but we're like hey only 12. yeah it wasn't no. me but it's a tough balance though because there yeah. is that but businesses need to be able to operate too yeah so what do you think? I mean, is there a question? There? Yeah, there is a question. <laughs> With you mentioned the um, you know the appetite for people to actually go out, and now we and we have a low percentage of capacity as it is. What do you see happening here for the rest for yourself and for the restaurant yeah. industry? Well, I think as as I mentioned, X number of people aren't going to want to do it. I was mm -hmm. surprised though when we first got indoor dining, that people actually some people started calling looking for reservations inside. Yeah. They didn't want to be out in the sun, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, the sun's not always your friend out there, right. and, or bugs, or, mm -hmm. or they just wanted air conditioning. I don't know what they wanted, sure. but we were surprised that anybody, I honestly was thinking maybe nobody's going to go inside. Um, we seem to, we're, we're, we basically can accommodate everybody so far, but there's demand for our indoor tables. There right. is demand, there is. which good. is great. But now what? Where, where do we go now right. as it gets colder? Uh, are people going to come in? And I, I don't think economically it's sustainable mm -hmm. past. I mean, we've been kind of doing budgets in my own home. I've never done a budget in my house in my life. And it's not because I was wealthy. Yeah. I was just lazy. Right. And I didn't want to do it, you know. I actually, I have two in college. So mm -hmm. I had to figure out a budget to get through next June sure. to pay off those two college years. Mm -hmm. And it gets scary when you get to February, March, April. And mm -hmm. with us not knowing what's going to happen, we certainly, the push of the PPP funds with the great weather, we certainly were able to pile up some money. And I'm mm -hmm. thrilled that we Good. have anything extra. Right. But now, yeah. it's, and you know, even the other side of this, if we're able to sustain through the winter right. and we get to next March, April, May, that's when we spend a lot of money mm -hmm. to get reopened. Yeah. You, it costs a lot costs of money, money to reopen places right. just to get stuff out of storage and broken umbrellas and, you know, on it goes. It's, it's hard, you know, and of course we have our vendors and the vendors, since we've been in business so long, they're pretty good with us. Mm -hmm. And right now we're very fortunate that we're mostly current with all of our vendors. Right. Matter of fact, I would say we are current with all of our vendors, which has not been the case in, pr in prior years. Right. When we got to that October, November place, it was like, oops, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I wish I, I could say I know what's going to happen, but I think without additional PPP money, if we just have an average weather year, it's going to be a struggle to get to April. Uh, speaking of times changing, uh, Holiday Express, uh, a band thing that you've been doing for I don't know how many 27 years. 27 years. 27 years. Uh, Seemed like a good idea. Yeah, it is a good idea. It's a, <laughs> basically, for our viewers, this is a tour de force music show that goes around during the holidays. Uh, raises money, uh, provides food and support. Yeah, what we what we primarily do is, as it evolved over the years. In the beginning, I was just going to bring a brand, a, 
a band around yeah. and play at some places. And I learned a lot of stuff early without getting too long on it. We didn't need to go to hospitals unless they're special needs hospitals um, because they already get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. You know, so we started digging and trying to find who's getting nothing. Yeah. And so we try to bring the biggest holiday party you can possibly have. So it's not just the band anymore. Right. You know, we bring all the food, we right. bring all the gifts. We bring, more importantly, we bring volunteers who paint faces. I mean, it sounds like a hundred years ago, I was in yeah. painting faces, really? Yeah. Hugging people, dancing yeah. with people? Imagine that. That was like a decade ago. Yeah, I mean. right. Um, so we, every year we used to start in the beginning of November and we go to Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And last year, last couple of years, we did a hundred places. So what are you gonna do this year? Um, what we did was we went into the studio, the studio, that's hilarious, <laughs> yeah. into our warehouse. <laughs> We treated it like a <laughs> right, studio, sure. and we recorded a show, okay. or actually a number of shows, mm -hmm. so that they can be adjusted to what the audience is. Right. Um, so we'll be sending out that show to people, and they can show it. But a lot of the charities we do, the Trenton Soup Kitchen, the St. John's Soup Kitchen, they're not putting up video screens, yeah. you know, so we can't do anything for them. I was just on the phone yesterday with my sister-in-law, right. Amy Robinson, who, uh, Amy Robinson DeHayes, who actually does all the bookings for us and has right. been doing it for many years. And I said to her yesterday, let's look and see, are there any places we can go, like the Trenton Soup Kitchen, where we could play out in the street, which is how it all started. Right. We were playing out in the street in all right. these places, you know. Bringing it back home. Um, is there something we can do? Mm -hmm. But it, it's beyond sad, you know. I, I spoke to some of the directors at various places, and one of them, the Matheny School up in Peapack, um, I spoke to the woman that runs their music program. And so I said, I know we can't come. I'm just sort of checking. And she yeah. said, oh, you definitely can't come here. <laughs> right. and, you know, and, right. and she and I are friends. Yeah. But what had happened, they'd lost four of their patients had died. Oh, yeah. And in a sense, worse, two of their staff yeah. had died. Yeah. And I shouldn't say worse, but you know what I mean? Sure. It's the in, their infrastructure gets challenged. Their ability to take care of people mm -hmm. who are so vulnerable, crazy. Yeah. So right now we're, we're, we made that video, so that's good. And we're thinking about partial stuff going out. but. And we're still going to deliver all the gifts, oh, good. the food when it's appropriate. That's right. the easy part. Yeah. We, we pack uh, close to 30,000 gift bags, yeah. and the gift bags have a lot of stuff in them, like a blanket and hats and T-shirts and mm. fun stuff. You know, it depends on the age of people, you know, books and crayons and whatever. And so they'll still get their gifts, but it's just right. not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. I well, know how people look forward. We look forward to it, yeah. as exhausting as it is. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, cramming 100 shows in five weeks is sort of crazy. Well, we'll see what happens in 2022. But yeah. uh, in the meantime, Tim McLuhan, thank you. New Jersey Renaissance man, New Jersey oh. Hall of Famer. <laughs> a great man. Thanks, Tim, for being here. Anytime. Okay. Well, now it's time to spotlight another one of NJBIA's New Good Neighbor Award winners. This time around, it's the RWJ Barnabas Health Athletic Performance Center at Rutgers University in Piscataway. The RWJ Barnabas Health Athletic Performance Center has been an absolute game changer for our programs. The new home for our men's basketball, women's basketball, gymnastics and wrestling programs. But importantly, it's really an example of what we intend to do as we move forward in Rutgers athletics. And even more important, it is a place where our student athletes come for all of their medical needs. Now, yeah, well, importantly, you know, men's basketball and women's basketball never had a practice facility here before at Rutgers. So for them to be able to play without a schedule, without having to worry about this team's on the court at this time, uh, is wonderful. It gives the kids a great opportunity and obviously as a result, it's a great recruiting tool for us. Uh, in gymnastics, we went from having no practice facility to one of the top three in the nation, and that's in our coaches' words. And in wrestling, uh, when you walk into that wrestling facility, again, best in the Big Ten, maybe best in the nation. And so as a recruiting tool, but also importantly, as a place for our players to develop, uh, it's best in class. Uh, the athletic director from a pretty prominent athletic program in this country came in because he had heard about the building, wanted to see it, and looked around, saw the whole building and said, Rutgers athletics will never be the same. So we went from having no facility to when parents walk in, you see the jaw drop, you see the surprise, you see the look on the student athlete's face, and uh, not surprisingly, we've had quite a few of our recruits who've come into this building, who before they leave the building, turn to coach and say, I'm coming to Rutgers. All right, a great facility for the Scarlet Knights. Well, that wraps up another edition of NJBIA's Money Your Business. We thank you all for being here, and we'll see you next time.